and let us give the Lord one more hand of praise. God is so worthy to be praised. So worthy to be praised. We have read our unison scripture together. However, I would like to tack on just one more portion of that chapter. If you could join me in the gospel according to John. And it is the custom of our house to stand as we are able all over the sanctuary for the reading of the word of God. And I will be reading very briefly from chapter 11, verses 1 through 5, and then I'll jump over to 20 through 25. Word of God reads as follows. Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. Jesus loved Martha and her, and her sister and Lazarus. Yet, when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. Somebody say two more days. Two more days. Verse 20. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha answered, I know he'll rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And you may have your seats in the presence of the Lord. I ask that you would pray with me briefly on the subject. I have a question. Hear the words of the prophet Stevie Wonder. <laughs> when the summer came, you were not around. Now the summer's gone and love cannot be found. Where were you when I needed you last winter, my love? When the winter came, you went further south. Parting from love's nest, leaving me in doubt. Where are you when I need you? Like right now. When the winter came, you were not around. Though the bitter wind, through the bitter winds, love could not be found. Where were you when I needed you? Last winter, my love. Spring will fill the air and you will come around. With your summer love, that will let me down. But where were you when I needed you? Last winter. In the words of my home pastor and first mentor in ministry, the Reverend Claudette Anderson Copeland, every relationship needs questions. No relationship can thrive without questions. Questions, linguistic expressions used to make a request for information, questions tools by which we mend the breaches in our understanding and means for bringing calm to our confusions. Questions, the light switches by which we attempt to illuminate our darkness, the bridges between our assumptions, our presumptions, and our observations, and the real truths of the matters of our lives. Questions are a way into deeper conversation, deeper understanding, and deeper clarity. It is often when we are confused, upset, frustrated, or simply 
when we're trying to get on the same page as somebody else that we must ask questions. To the young people in the room, you know something about the questions of your parents. Where are you going? Who will be there? Will there be adult supervision? And what time are you going to be home? To the married folk in the room, you know something about the questions of your spouses. Where are you going? Who will be there? Will there be adult supervision? What time will you be home? <laughs> Through questions, we can dissipate our curiosities, clarify when we're confused. Through questioning, we can probe when we are suspicious. And some relationships operate under the modality of don't ask, don't tell. And nine times out of 10, if you were to ask the parties of such relationships, they may tell you that they suffer from a stifled sense of security, a jilted sense of love, and a constant fear of the unknown because there are no questions. Because where there are no questions, there can be no light, no faith, no development of trust, no cultivation of confidence, and there can also be no accountability. And on this morning, I am brave and I'm courageous and I'm human enough to believe that no matter who you are or where you find yourself in life today, that you too may just have some questions, questions that wake you up in the morning, questions that follow you throughout your day, questions that are with you when you lie down. You may have some questions of yourself, such as, when am I going to get it together? Or why do I keep doing X, Y, Z, fill in the blank? Or what was I thinking when I did fill in the blank? Or maybe you have questions of somebody else. Do you really love me? Do you really care for me? Why do you keep on doing X, Y, Z, fill in the blank? And what were you thinking when you did that thing that you did? Or maybe you have some questions of the world. Like, why do some women sell out to patriarchy, resorting to making explicit tapes and commodifying them for their 15 minutes of fame? Or a question such as, why is racism still so operative in the world? And why is the plantation model of leadership so obviously replicated in some of the biggest organizations in the world, such as the NBA, such as the LA Clippers? I, I wanna know, I, I wanna know why in 2014 it's still like that. Or maybe you have some questions for God such as, are you really gonna come through for me this time? Or why are you taking so long to do what I thought that you would have done by now? Or do you really forgive me for what I did that one time, God? Or when do you really plan on sending me somebody to live my life in fulfillment with? Or when do you really plan to fill my womb with life? I have some questions for you, God. Because as people in relationship with God, sometimes we get confused when it seems like God's actions in the moment are contrary to what we know, believe, or have previously experienced with God. And when this is the case, we have got to ask God some questions. Which is why in the text, Mary called Jesus to account when she told him, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. In other words, Jesus, where were you when we needed you? She asked this question to Jesus because of their relationship. And we know that Jesus had a tight relationship with these three individuals, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. It was in their home in a little town called Bethany, a place where outcasts and rejected ones lived, that Jesus spent a lot of his downtime. It was a humble place, probably much like his own hometown of Nazareth. He loved these three, and their home was the place that he went to get a little rest and rejuvenation amidst his hectic ministry schedule. Yes, Jesus loved these three. And one could even suggest that all the love that Jesus could need in return was wrapped up in this one home. 
If Jesus commanded that we love him with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, one sees that all of this was there in the person of Mary, who would love to just sit at his feet and adore him and listen to him. In his home, in this home, he could also get delicious food for his soul and stimulating conversation from his mind from Martha. And he could receive the brotherly kinship that came from the presence of Lazarus. There was all kinds of love between Jesus, Mary, and Martha, and Lazarus. And the trouble in the text today is that despite loving Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, they find themselves in a bind that Jesus could have easily fixed. And the trouble in the text is that despite loving Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, they find themselves in a situation in which, in which rather than fixing the situation, Jesus knowingly, intentionally, and purposely withdraws his presence from them. This presence went beyond, I have to go, I have other things to do. It went beyond, I'm busy and I just can't make it to you right now. No, Jesus' withdrawal in this text was purposeful. It was more along the lines of, I know that you're in a bind, my sisters and my brother. I know that you're in a situation that seems to be getting worse and worse by the day. And while I could come to you, to comfort you and to console you, to turn your situation around before you give up hope. I'm choosing to stay where I am for two more days. I'm choosing not to run to your rescue, not to run to your side. Yes, there's, there's some trouble in the text because even if Jesus didn't fix the situation, he could have at least been there to make it more bearable for the people that he loved. He could have been there to keep watch with Mary and Martha. He could have been there just to show that he loved them. But instead, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was, and Jesus' absence was a costly absence. The absence of his presence allowed for the severity of the illness to increase. The absence of his presence allowed for the setting in of hopelessness. The absence of Jesus' presence meant that the days got longer and the nights got longer as well. Does anybody in the sanctuary know about the absence of Jesus? Here, there's trouble in this text because the longer he was gone, the worse the sickness got. The longer Jesus was gone, the louder the voices of doubt and fear became in their spirits. The longer Jesus was gone, the greater the heartbreak, the greater the disappointment. Does anybody know about the absence of Jesus? Has anybody ever had to stop and pause and look around and ask, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The absence of Jesus is so devastating, so disorienting, and so completely problematic that it can feel like a slow death. And I don't mean the blessings of Jesus, like Jesus coming in and swooping in and saving the day or healing miraculously. I mean the presence of Jesus, the presence of Jesus that can give you peace while the storm is breaking out. I mean the presence of Jesus that reminds you that you're loved when you're doubting if you are. I mean the presence of Jesus, not the works, but his presence. His presence can mean the difference between life and death in a life and death situation. And Mary and Martha knew it in this text. But he said that he loved them. And when someone's actions do not align with their words, there is often the immediate need to ask questions. And in this text, Jesus' absence didn't reflect the nature of his relationship. Did it mean that he didn't love them? And so Mary felt the need to ask him about it. She felt the need to ask him about his absence. And so she asked him the question, where were you when I needed you? 
And she may have been a little nervous, you all, but she asked the question anyway. She may have been afraid, not only just to ask, but also been afraid of what he might have said in response, but she asked the question anyway. And she may have thought that it was wrong to question the Son of God, but she asked the question anyway. And I like that she asked because what it shows is that asking the question doesn't mean that you don't believe. Asking the question doesn't signify the absence of one's faith. It really signifies a, a, a relationship that needs to be worked out. If I don't ask you a question about why you left or disappointed me, it really might mean that I don't care. I'm fine. I'm going to move on. I'll be okay without you. But she asked the question because this was not like Jesus. She asked the question because she was interested in working out the relationship. And if you allow me a moment of personal transparency, I must admit that I struggle with that voice in my head that tells me, don't ask God no questions, Nichelle. Somebody in my past told me that it was the wrong thing to do to ask God why God was doing what God was doing and why God wasn't doing what God wasn't doing. And sometimes in my grown life, I struggle with that voice that tells me, don't ask the question. He don't owe you no explanations anyways. But I have to fight that voice. I have to fight that voice because if it is my belief and my confession that God is not the author of confusion, it must be my practice to ask God for some wisdom. If it is my belief that God is not a God that he should lie, it should be my custom to go to God and ask God for the truth about my life. And because I believe that he is, that God is the wonderful counselor, I must take it to God and ask God, can you please help a sister out? And if it is my belief that my God will not forsake me for asking or will not turn God's face on me for asking, sometimes I got to fight that voice down and ask God the hard questions such as, where were you? I was looking for you. I thought that you would come when I wanted you to come. Why didn't you stop me from making that bad decision? And if I can be honest one more time, I have found in my fight with that voice that I would rather go to God with the hard and difficult and sticky and not supposed to ask type questions than suffer in silence in my confusion, than suffer in silence in my pain and in my withdrawal. I would rather ask God a question than fold my arms and be mad at God. And is there anyone that in here that can relate? God, I have some questions. I have some things that have occurred in my life that I do not understand. I have some situations that are beyond my control. I need some, I need some help. Can I ask you a few questions? And the text comes today to ask us a question. When was the last time that you asked Jesus about it? When was the last time that you asked him about the situation that you thought was all over, but you thought and you thought that it could not get better and the situation that you thought there was a period at the end of the sentence? When was the last time that you asked Jesus about it? Because it suggests here in this text that Jesus can handle our questions. And that you don't have to brush your questions off with false answers and fear that you shouldn't be asking God no questions. And not only was he open to her question, but he was available to give her an answer. Because of this relationship that was full of grace and mercy and love, 
she was able to ask him some questions without fear. And not only did I love that she asks, but I love even more what Jesus does in response to her question. I like that he says that I am the resurrection, the life, but I love more what he does in response to the question. See, because when questions arise in relationships, it's one thing to get a direct response. And you would be good to get an honest, direct response. But the truth of the matter is that if we give it some time, if we take a step back and pay close attention, we will see our answers. So you're wondering, does he love me or does she like me? Is this the right time or the right job or the situation for me? Sometimes if we just take the pressure off of the question, take the pressure off of the person with whom we are in relationships, the answers won't come immediately, but they'll come over time. They come in stages and phases. And sometimes they don't come in the form of words, but in the form of showings, signs, actions, and maybe even signs and wonders and miracles. And so going beyond his words to her, he shows her what he means. He shows her what it can be in her life to have him, the resurrection and the life. He shows her what these metaphors can amount to for her, li for her life. He shows her that by I am the resurrection and the life, what he really means is that nothing dead can stay dead in my presence. What he really means was that death was antithetical to the life within him and that all things could live again in his name and by his power. He showed her what he meant. He didn't just give an answer, but he showed her what he meant. And this is what he meant when he said that this sickness will be for the glory of God. He meant that I'm going to go beyond my words and I'm going to show you a little bit of who I am. And I wonder if there's anybody in the sanctuary that may have some questions, that may be wondering some things about your life or about your walk with God. And you want God to go beyond giving you a simple answer, but you want God to show you a little bit of God's glory, to show you a little bit of who God is and what God can do. You want a show not showing of God's power in the midst of your questions. I want God to show some glory and show us some healing in our communities from cancer and Alzheimer's and HIV AIDS and show us some deliverance from our addictions. Show us that he can fix our brokenness. I want God to show us some relationships resurrected from the dead and relationships delivered from domestic violence and show us relationships delivered from misunderstanding. I want God to show up and show us a redeemed justice system. I want God to show up and show us liberated jails and prisons and show us families who forgive each other and show us something like we have never seen before. I want God to show up and answer my questions in a way that I will not be confused anymore. In a way that I will know surely God is God over over my situations and God is God over my questions. I want to see the glory of God in my life. I'm talking about healed relationships. I'm talking about broken addictions. I'm talking about drugs and alcohol obliterated from our homes. I'm talking about sexualized violence becoming a way of the past. I want some glory in my life, in my church in my community, in my home, at my job. I want to see something that I've never seen before. I want God to show me that my understanding is so limited. I want God to blow our minds with what God can do. Cause you know their minds were blown when Lazarus came out of the tomb. I want my mind to be blown. For as long as our minds have been transfixed 
by depression and confusion and sadness and whatever else, these mental health issues that we need to address, our minds are due for a miracle, a reminder that God does still show up and reveal God's glory. I want to go beyond the surface with God. There's so much more to this walk with God than tiptoeing around this imaginary God that doesn't want to have anything to do with our questions. I want a God that is so personal, that is so close, so real and so intimate. That he will answer all of our questions. The word of God for the people of God.